Welcome to another open uh, episode of Open World Chat. I'm John Odom, and I'm joined, as always, by Jim Dandino, my co-host. Hey. Um, always there, solid, and always has the smart questions when I start, you know, looking at squirrels or something as, you know, ADD me as want to do. <laughs> and we've got Elizabeth Carpenter with us today, who is a professional stunt performer with a vast, vast resume, all those geeky movies and TV shows that Jim and I like to watch, stunt performer, actor, musician, and clearly slacking because, you know, poet, performance artist, um, you know, painter, they're not on there. So get with it, Elizabeth. Jeez. God. Doesn't mean I don't do them. I just don't advertise. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're thrilled to have you. And before we go anywhere... I got to ask you, you know, I mean, there's sort of classic ideas of, you know, you go out to Hollywood, you, you know, you're working on becoming an actor, maybe you've gone to acting school or then, you know, Shakespeare in the park or something, and you got to, you know, pay your dues, you know, waiting tables for a while. What on earth do you do to break into the stunt performance industry? I, I was trying to get my brain around that. Well, that's a really good question. Thanks for having me on your show. I'm really excited. I came out here originally when I was 19 as a circus performer, and that's a whole different story. But um, along the way, being out here, you meet all kinds of people who do all kinds of things. And there's a lot of overlap, um, especially now, but even back then uh, in 2000, there was a lot of overlap between the circus and the stunt community. And so one of the places that I went to train is at a really legendary stuntman's backyard, Bob Yerkes, who's, I think he's... Close to 90 if he's not 90 and he's still around. He's still hanging out doing handstands. He's still hosting people training in his giant backyard with a high fall tower and a flying trapeze. And I mean, he really was was the man back in the day. And he really kind of came in at a time when circus segued into stunts. So I was kind of around that anyway as a circus performer, but I had no idea at all about the film industry. Um, I was raised in Vermont not a part of that at all. So that all kind of came later. And after 15 year career as a circus performer, you know, I'd kind of, I'd, I'd lost the original motivation of like, Oh my God, this is amazing. I'd done a lot. I'd traveled a lot. I'd had a phenomenal career, but I was kind of ready to switch things up. And so I had a couple of friends that went, you know, you should get into stunts. And I went, okay, what is that? How would I do that? So really how you get in most people, if you aren't born into it, most people have some sort of a specialty that they come in with, and it's really all networking and who you know. So there's paying your dues like everything else, but we don't have agents like an actor does. So we basically are our own agent. So we have to go out. We train with other people who are our peers. We try to meet stunt coordinators. COVID has kind of killed the hustle, but up until COVID hustling is how you get a job. So back in the day before cell phones and internet, people had printed headshots, resumes, and they figured out where people were filming. And they went and they walked on sets and they tried to find the stunt coordinator and take even a second to just say, nice to meet you. Here's my headshot and resume. Would you consider me? Sometimes they're really friendly. Other times they're like, why are you on my set? I'm busy. My experience, 99% of the time, they'll at least take a minute out of their day to say, hey, nice to meet you, shake your hand. Maybe they'll look at your resume, ask you a couple of questions, or they'll go, you know what, we're in the middle of something. Can you leave that in my trailer? And then you see if they ever call you. Um, these days with the internet and the phone, you know, there's stunt directories where people can go on and search if they need to double somebody, the sizes, the weights, the looks. But a lot of it is just still word of mouth. And so... You know, if I'm out training with my peers and one of them is working for a big coordinator that is busy and doesn't want to go digging through directories and goes, hey, man, I need a girl who's this size and this height and this skill set and I'm around them, they're going to go, oh, call her. So even as a full time working stunt professional in my downtime, number one, I like to train. But number two, you kind of always have to keep the hustle in the network so that you stay in pe people's minds because everyone gets really busy and you would think, well, why wouldn't they think of me? But they don't always. So there it is. So introverts need not apply is what you're saying. Well, 
introverts need to turn on a public persona if they want to apply. So one of the things that I personally had to work really hard on when I know people and as a performer, I'm very outgoing, but I was very, very shy for a lot of my childhood and not just not that person that would come up to a stranger and be super friendly. And so I got to a point in my career here where I kind of had to sit down with myself and went, look, this is an important part of being successful. So even if it, you know, doesn't feel normal, you're going to have to change that. And so I worked really hard on just being friendly and making conversation and saying hello and kind of training that skill. Because yeah, if you don't, you may get lucky, but it's very likely that you will not work. So you said that everybody has a, has a specialty coming in. What was yours? I was a competitive gymnast starting at age seven. And then I started working with the circus when I was 13. So mine was um, just physical, high work, flippy work. Um, okay. So in the stunt world, my specialty per se was and still is. Um, high work and wire work. So anything where you're in wires and harnesses and things and you're moving and you're very physical. I love that stuff. But yeah, most people will come in. Some people have martial arts. Some people are water people. Some people ride motorcycles or drive. Mm-hmm. Okay. What is, what's getting, the hardest to pick up? Oh. <laughs> oh, I was just wondering if they're getting hit by cars, people, or if that's something <laughs> everybody has to do. Yeah, everybody does not have to do anything. You can always turn a job down. Yes, there are getting hit by cars, people. I've actually met somebody who said, I love doing car hits. And I looked at her and went, you're nuts. I will be sure to pass that along next time I get a call because I do not love getting hit by cars. I have done a couple of car hits. I'm proud that I got through them and just got bumped up, but they can be really gnarly. So I I have friends that will not do them. that just say, you know what? I'm not the right fit for your job. Call someone else. Because that's part of being smart in the business is knowing your skill set and your capacity and saying no. (laughs) So what do you find yourself saying no to? What do you hate doing? What's your line? I wouldn't say I hate doing anything, but I do say no to car hits. There was one exception because the coordinators were really smart and strategic with how they filmed it. They filmed it in pieces. And honestly, I think it turned out much better than if you just go for it. But yeah. I'm not 20 years old anymore. I really value my body and those can be really gnarly. And you don't, as a good stunt performer, you don't get to show up on a set when you've committed to do something and go, "Mm, yeah, that's not really going to work for me. I think I'll get hurt. If you commit, you're in. Like, unless you're really hurt, you say, I'm good. I can do it again. Here we go. So yeah, those are not my favorite. Um, I don't do a bunch of really gnarly driving stuff. I do love driving, but it's a very, very um, time intensive, specialized skill. And so, you know, I've done some driving jobs, but they're, they're more kind of, what's the best word? Uh, They're, they're more minimal. Like, and I've taken some stunt driving courses. I really like it. But for me, I mean, I've put in the thousands and thousands of hours doing all the physical stuff. And where with cars, I put in much fewer. And so I have a lot to catch up before I'm going to go, oh, yeah, I can go, you know, slide right up and stop four inches from a camera. I'm sure I could, but I don't practice that enough that I'm going to say I'm going to do that without hurting somebody. Same with motorcycles. I just got asked to do a job. I do ride. We own my husband and I both ride. Um, We own bikes. And I have done one job where I crashed it intentionally. But again, that's not my forte. I don't train that often. So I did just have somebody ask if I would want to do that. And I said, you know, honestly, I'm sure I could, but why don't you give that to somebody else? Because it can be really dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I really like the physical stuff. For me, that's fun. Fighting, high work, wire work. What are you, what are you most proud of? Like what if, when you think back on your career as a stunt performer, what is the first thing, what, like, what is, what is the job that you picture in your head when you're seeing yourself do your work? Um, honestly, there are two. One, one was uh, the first big film I ever did was the Divergent series. I got mm-hmm. to double the lead, Shailene Woodley, in the second and the third one. So on Insurgent, um, I think I'd been kind of dabbling the business for the, a year or so, and I'd done a couple of things. But I got called in as a second double on that specifically for my aerial experience because the double they brought in, that wasn't her specialty. And they had a huge action sequence, which they ended up pretty much using for the trailer. 
And as many productions do, they got to this point where all of a sudden they're like, we need that now. We need it done. And the coordinators went, um, okay, what are we going to do? We need somebody. So for me, that was a really, really fun job. Not only was I brand new, so it was kind of a dream job right off the bat, but it was me working with the stunt coordinator and assistant and eight riggers to get, you know, they showed me a pre-vis, a pre-visualization that was animated going, hey, here's what we're trying to achieve. And it's this girl running and flying through the air and swinging and catching things and crashing into things. And so I got to work with all of these riggers who were really brilliant and who would go, okay, so we're going to work on this gag today. And they just kind of look around this big warehouse and they'd put a pick point here and a point there and a point there. And then I would get up and I'd get in it and I'd, you know, get to swing around and fly around and do what I love doing. So that was really, really fun. And then there was one other gag I did pretty recently on a really hilarious comedy on Netflix called The Wrong Missy. Um, Again, I got called in super last minute because of what I do. I had worked with the head rigger and they weren't getting what they needed from their double. So they brought me in for this scene where I'm hanging in Hawaii. I'm with my back against a cliff about 100 feet in the air, just looking out at the beautiful ocean in a short little dress. And she basically falls off the cliff and tumbles down. So I'm in a wire and we do, you know, takes of like falling down head first. We didn't hit the ground, obviously, but then falling and tumbling. Right. Just a bunch of different ones of those bouncing off the cliff. Then they they put in a tree that they built. So coming and bouncing off the tree. So it was this whole series of just falling and flying. And it was awesome. It was super fun. It was just two days worth of that. And yeah, it's really fun. If you haven't seen it, watch it. That little snip is on my stunt reel. So you can see that. But the movie itself is hilarious. It's going on the list. <laughs> you know, um, I'm thinking you were talking about the uh, Divergent series that so many more movies now are either superhero or just general action movies that have to essentially be superhero and keep up with it. I'm, it seems like more and more of the work you do is gravitating towards the sort of acrobatic, the aerialist, a lot of wire work. Has that been um, more opportunities now than, than you did 10 years ago? Uh, for me personally or in general and stuff? Uh, well, both, really. That's a good question. I do feel like stylistically action changes a lot. So I would say yes. Yeah, for me, it's really a mix of what I get. I mean, sometimes I get those specialized calls where it's exactly what I do. Other times my job is literally, you know, getting yanked into a wall and falling down or just riding a motorcycle or, you know, sprinting and then tripping. It's just, it stunts is such a bizarre set of skills Um, I love the specialized stuff. There's definitely a lot more fighting, I think, and especially for women, because there are more female characters than 20 years ago, where it was, you know, maybe just Buffy and like one, you know, the one person in the Matrix. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so there's definitely more opportunity for that. That's pretty interesting. Well, it's really encouraging to hear that, you know, a lot of the jobs are just, you know, tripping and falling down because, you know, (laughs) uh, I can do that. (laughs) I need a new you would think, and sometimes you get actors and actresses that go, "Oh, I can do that." And oh, and then they are smash very their talented, nose. and other of them. I mean, I've had ones who are like, "Oh, it's fine. It's just a little fall," and then they'll fall and go, "Oh, my neck hurts. Never mind." Oh, no, because and the insurance rates shoot through the roof for the whole yeah. production. Well, right? because yep. it seems like a little thing, but it's. I'll turn it around and say, I mean, I do act, but I'm not an actor in the same way as like a huge Jackman or you know Kate Winslet. That's not my entire life. So that's like me going, oh, sure. Yeah, I can take this acting role and then just do the skills. We all kind of are brought in to do what we do well. Fair enough. That was my self-deprecating humor didn't quite fit there. So I totally. (laughs) No, it's funny. And I love that you said that. It's very common. (laughs) <laughs> speaking of john falling on his face like an amateur in front of everybody um <clears throat> excuse me um are there red flags that you that you are looking for when you're coming into a production because like your job is it's not entering data into spreadsheets right like um your occupational hazards are a little bit steeper than carpal tunnel yes yes there are as a stunt performer i definitely like to know who i'm working for So 
My boss is a stunt coordinator. Sometimes they stunt coordinate and also second unit direct because a lot of times second unit is the action and it's become more and more common as everything is more action driven. But yeah, there are definitely, I mean, I have my handful of favorite stunt coordinators to work for. There are a couple that I would not work for just because of safety issues or style of working personalities. Mm -hmm. I I just like to be very aware of what's going on. Safety is a huge issue. Um, And the reason my few handful of favorites are my favorites are they're extremely safe. They would never put any of their performers in a situation that isn't safe. And they get very comfortable strategically speaking up to producers, directors, and just going, nope, that's not possible. That someone's going to get injured where a lot of people, and especially, you know, when somebody's newer, if somebody hasn't been coordinating as long as they, they really want this job and they said they'll do it, you know, they might not be willing to take that stand. They might just go, yeah, yeah, we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. And then accidents happen. So even when you're really safe, some accidents do happen, but they're much, much less likely. Um, and also attention to detail. It's really important, not just with your boss, within your team as well, to just have each other's backs, to look out. Like, I tend not to be on my phone much unless we're away from set, we're not working, because it can be the littlest thing. I mean, I've been on a set where somebody really, really experienced, had too much going on, and they went to unclip from a harness before they clipped into the other one. And so you want your boss, you want all your peers to kind of be in that mindset of keeping an eye out. So that you catch each other when those little things do slip, because we work really long days. And a lot of times, you know, you might be super experienced, but you're overtired or you're distracted. And if you don't have people looking out for you again, that's how accidents happen. So, yeah, there's there's definitely red flags. It's just kind of keeping your eyes open. And again, it's that thing where even if you're on set, if something doesn't feel right, take a second and say something, because that could be life or death. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I was watching the uh, documentary Stunt Women last night in, in preparation. So I'm I'm very curious about, you know, your experience as a woman as a stunt performer. And the first thing that jumps to my head is, is wigging still something that's really going on? I mean, are there still, you know, maybe old school stunt coordinators who just, you know, they're paternalistic and, you know, they think, well, a man's got to do this. So slap a wig on and push him out there. Is that something that's still a problem? I would say very minimally. I would imagine that there's probably a little bit of it. The experiences that I've been in where it happens, um, it's less and less because there are more stunt women. There are more stunt women of color, which has you know, also been an issue. Stunt people of color as well. The times that I've seen something like that happen is when there's a really, really, really specialized stunt And whatever women are qualified to do, it aren't available. And so the only person qualified is a man. I personally have not been in a situation where something like that was just kind of done because someone's like, eh, the woman can't do it. Or, oh, I don't feel like looking. I've certainly heard that that's happened. um, But there's a lot more visibility now and a lot more accountability. So I don't think it's happening as much anymore. You know, and again, everybody's different. I've certainly worked with old school people that work very differently, that think very differently. But, you know, I like to think that we all kind of keep each other in check and and lift each other up and help to evolve. So yeah, again, my experience has not really been that as much. I did, you know, I, I did a job where I ended up coming in, a friend of mine prepped and was supposed to double the lead uh, on, in a movie and then she got injured and I was brought in to replace her. But in the lag between when I was brought in and it was filming in Thailand in the lag, they didn't have anybody. And none of the women on the Thai team had the physical capability for the skills they needed. So they did end up wigging a guy for a couple of things. Cause that was just their option. And that happens sometimes. Mm-hmm. But not in the same way it used to, it sounds like. No. And yeah. Well, that's good. That's progress. Yeah. A lot of progress. And it's interesting because the way you describe the industry, it sounds much more, I mean, like there's more sort of camaraderie amongst you all than I, I would have expected. It's, I would have expected to be a little more cutthroat for the jobs. You know? so. <laughs> well, it can be. It depends on the personality of a person. For myself, I feel like 
you know, there's jobs that maybe I'd really like to get. But I also look at it like I, tr- I tend to make friends with my competition. You know, your competition are the people, the similar size and build and, and skill set to yourself. And I tend to make friends with them because if I'm not available, I want to be able to put a qualified person's name in and vice versa. And then if my friend gets a job, even if I'm disappointed for myself, I can be happy for my friend. So that's the way that I work. I certainly know stunt performers that are not like that at all and that are highly competitive and that just want every job they want and work and take every job. And, you know, that's that's kind of life. You get all personalities. So I got to ask you, um, you've got a. I don't want to get you in trouble here, but you've got a gig coming up. That's a, that's a, a very big deal. To those such as us, if I'm not mistaken, um, and I was looking at your IMDB page, the Obi-Wan series. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, to say, I know you can't tell us much about it because otherwise, you know, they come after you with the dogs and the helicopters. <laughs> what if we, what if we talk about it in code? What if we talk about <laughs> your next job on Ewan McGregor's divorce settlement? Yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> there we go. That'll that's it. That's it. They won't know. If you talked Nobody about it know. in code, you'd be doing exactly what Disney does because that's what they do. They don't even tell us the name of the project coming in. They have a code name for it. What was oh. the code name for Obi Wan? Can you share? Can you share anything about it I at all? I don't know if I'm actually allowed to share that, but <laughs> okay. I can give you an example of like. I'm not told, hey, we're, we need to hire a double for Obi Wan. I'm told, hey, we need to hire a double for Vasquez Rocks. I'm like, okay. And then, of course, eventually when you get on set, you know what it is and you go, oh, okay, interesting. But yeah, it's just kind of that thing. So, yeah. So long days shooting in the desert, huh? No, actually, my I guess there were a couple of long days. I was I was on it over the course of a couple of months in the summer, usually two or three days a week. I was doubling an actress. I did get to be a stormtrooper once, which was really fun. That nice. was a long, hot day out in the desert. But most of what I did was actually on set. And the set was phenomenal. It was, yeah. it was really amazing. The technology is incredible. Nice. I am uh, very excited for this show. Uh, so yeah. general sense that I get from you, like we only get, only the people who are really super in and super plugged in see kind of the behind the scenes stuff and and see the technical side of what you do most of the time what the general public hears about what you do is when the cw shows are hurting somebody or when people are yelling on twitter about the oscars not having a stunt performer category but it seems to me like not just a camaraderie but it, it seems very it seems a lot safer than it's made out to be is that an accurate read or is that just your experience because you're smart about picking your spots (laughs) These days, I would say it's much more safe than what it used to be. Um, Even like a generation or a couple generations ago, I think it was much more about like who can get hit the hardest, who can do something the gnarliest, you know, like battle scars were a thing that you wanted to wield. Mm -hmm. But as we all know, when you do that, when you're young, you know, it's hard to walk when you're older. (laughs) So I think people have intentionally gotten a lot smarter Um, And part of the reason, too, why a lot of stunt people are second unit directing is that there's a lot of movie magic, you know. So, for example, you know, one of the main things you learn with fighting is how to stack your shots. You know, we're not sometimes you hit each other. Sometimes you make some contact, but you're not like punching somebody in the nose. You just line up a camera angle so that it looks like it and they take their reaction. So, um, yes, I think these days it's much, much safer and, and people also realize, well, if it's safe, we're not paying insurance because people are getting injured. Right. They're able to work longer. So it's really, it's a strategic thing. Yeah. So unless you're on Jackie Chan's crew, it's actually <laughs> a good life, right? <laughs> I mean, I would love to be on Jackie Chan's crew. He's just such a badass, you know? He's he's unbelievable. He's he's one of my favorites. But the, the that, those those movies were the first time I ever got excited for the credits in my life because just watching him get torn to shreds filming filming these movies yeah. was tough it was tough Oof. yep he's full on <laughs> yeah. i was i had to ask i wanted to ask about being i mean you were in captain marvel that's another one that's cool to me what was that yeah. experience like that was awesome um again i was on that i want to say maybe for two and a half weeks um i was doubling annette benning lovely lovely person Ooh. She And she didn't have a ton of action. There was one really big gag. And then some of it was just kind of helping set up the shots, you know, giving her pads for different things. Um, but just being on the set was incredible. 
Um, you know, obviously those are chances too where I got to hang out with different stunt performers that I maybe hadn't met or spent as much time with. So it's good networking, um, watching how stunts were done, even when it wasn't me helping to support. But yeah, the set was incredible. The costumes were incredible. Um, I always really get a kick out of kind of being that fly on the wall and watching and listening to how the director directs and how the DPs film and kind of hearing what they talk about and the direction they give and then watching what the result is on the monitor in real time. I love that. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty amazing experience and I really liked the movie. So the locking down they must do on you. I mean, Disney's legendary for, you know, nobody mentioned yeah. what we're doing. I, that must have been, what is that like? That must be surreal. I mean, it, you hear these stories about it being so draconian. Kind of. I mean, I guess maybe I'm just used to it. I'm not, you know, I talk with my husband and we're both in the business. So it's, he doesn't go talking to other people about it. And I mean, I guess you just get so that you know what you can and can't say to whom, and you're just careful who you speak with. But um, yeah, to me, it's kind of more a funny thing than anything else. I go on, I'm like, okay, it's Disney, you know, I'm not, I try to post on social media because it's part of what we do these days, but I'm not that person that's trying to sneak pictures and like, Ooh, maybe I can get away with it. So (laughs) there, there are. There's always people who want that. I'm that person who has to remind myself, oh, yeah, I need to take a picture with my actress. I kind of forget those things. But yeah, it's, you know, I understand why they do it. I think probably all buffs do because you don't want things to be spoiled or leaked or they really want to make sure it's it's done as it should be. So I understand it. But yeah, it is. It is funny being on those sets where it's like that, where other things, especially TV shows are like, hey, post about us, advertise. Here's our handle. Yeah. You know? So do you want to be doing this when you're 90? How far, do, how long do you see yourself uh, in this industry? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not sure I really have an answer. I don't want to be performing full time when I'm 90 for sure. But I've always had that kind of edge of liking to perform. So, I mean, who knows? Like, there are roles where they're looking for a 90-year-old to just do some random thing, and they're not generally getting hit by a car, you know? (laughs) I can't say that I won't want to. Um, I may segue into coordinating. I may segue into some other aspect of things. I've had somebody say, oh, you would be a good producer. So I've kind of gone like, huh, that's interesting. I never thought to pursue that. Maybe I'll look into what producing takes. And then there's the music side of things. I love that as well. So, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of organically going to let my career path take itself as it does. You're you're living the dream here. It's uh, yeah, it's great. It it is an amazing to look at your stunt reel too. I mean, uh, folks in your business do superhuman things, and you know, I feel fortunate to get down the stairs when I've gotten up in the morning. (laughs) So it's really extraordinary. I hear that. I'm really, really grateful for you coming on the show and and giving us a behind the scenes look at your life as a stunt performer. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to hear it. And um, like I said, I listened to a couple of your podcasts and uh, my stepkid really liked them as well. We were listening the other day and was like, oh, this is really good. Oh, that's cool that you're going to be on it. So how blue do I run? Huh? (laughs) How, How blue do I run on these? I forget. (laughs) <laughs> Am I, do I curse more or less than normal on air oh. probably yeah. less but you know kids oh, thank God. hear so much stuff I don't think it even phases them uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm really <laughs> terrified at um, exactly how my kids are going to start using the curses because it's going to be great they, <laughs> no they haven't already my daughter thinks that stupid is the worst word in the world okay you're um, doing good yeah so far Except yeah that ain't gonna she last. still hurt us pretty bad. Just, you guys are bad parents thing. It uh, cuts right to the right to the heart. It just gets worse and worse. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. It has been yeah. a lot of fun. Thanks yeah, so much. thanks, guys. So great meeting you. You too. See you later. Bye. And thanks, folks, for listening. You can come back and hear us in a couple weeks where we'll be talking us some Zelda. As always, our theme music is by Christopher Piatic.